we will now have some stories that the children will relate and in the meantime we can also get ready for Swamiji's talk which will follow this part of the satsang. Hi, good evening friends. My name is Arun and uh, on this auspicious day of Swamiji's moksha, Swami Kriyananda's moksha, I am going to narrate a story uh, related to him. So once it so happened that Swamiji's body got very sore due to some reason and so his disciples suggested that it would be good uh, if he got a massage. Uh, so they searched for a masseur and they found a young guy whose name was Pavan. So they called him that evening and he turned up uh, and he gave him a massage. But it so happened that because he did not bring a massage table with him and they, were ex uh, and they did not have one, so Swamiji had to take massage on his bed. And uh, though he liked it a lot, still he felt, he thought that he would feel much better if he had a massage table also. That's why when Pavan had given the massage and he was about to leave, Swamiji just asked him to come, the, uh, to come again next week and the next time bring with him a massage table also. But Pavan, at this, uh, but Pavan said that he does not have a massage table and, that's, uh, and uh, because he's, uh, his financial he does not have enough financial resources and plus uh, his wife is pregnant and they're expecting a baby and that's why he's already under some financial stress. At this point, Swamiji said that he would buy him a massage table uh, and if, if if he could, and it would be better if he could just tell him the approximate price right now. So, Pawan said that it would be around thousand rupees and dollars. dollars. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> thousand dollars, and Swamiji said fine, and Pawan left. So the next week, Pawan came back, but he was very disappointed. And this was because. Uh, he came back uh, as soon as he entered, uh, as soon as Swamiji asked him that what's the price of the table, he said in a disappointed voice that it's, it's much higher than I expected and I, I don't think you need to buy one for me, it, I don't really need it. it, it's not important. So Swamiji said just name the price and Pavan told him the figure uh, and it turned out to be seriously great. So Swamiji said that even I was not expecting that much, but I have promised it and I will give that money, that much money to you. Saying that, he quickly took out his purse and handed him over the money. Now, I don't actually need to explain how was Pavan feeling. Because just imagine that you need money and the guy turns up and he gives you a great fortune of money. So you know how would it feel to you, how grateful you would be to him. So somewhat same was the position with Pavan and he almost broke into tears and then uh, and, and he was really astonished that how could such a, uh, how could someone have so much sympathy. But with Pavan there was one more case, uh, one more thing that uh, which he told to Narayaniji later that he, he was an orphan and he grew up in an orphanage and from his from uh, from when he was a child he had a very burning desire to feel the love of a father to feel how does it to come to know how does it feel to have the love of a father and that was that was the real reason behind why he was so astonished and shaken because today uh, i mean on that day he felt that love so that's how the story ends thank you in this story, Swamiji was a, a young boy, and so I'm going to refer to him as Walters. When Swamiji was 13, he, his family could not return to Europe because of the war. In America, he had to go to a school called Kent School. But before going, to the, going there, he had to study in Hackley, a boarding school. In Hackley, there was a bully called Tommy Maters. He thought it was a disgrace to America that an English boy was staying there. He made a point to sit beside Walters while eating. After seeing the way he ate, Tommy decided to hit Walters. As he was weaker than 
Tommy, Walters could not defend himself. But Walters never agreed to Tommy. His hitting made no difference to him. Thus, Walters had won mentally. Vineet and I will be sharing. Vineet recently visited, you know, Brindavan. And uh, with Brindavan, where one of our devotees is doing a great work, it just suddenly opened, uh, you know, a chapter in the life of Ananda in our seva to Master and Swamiji. And it's very interesting. He'll describe the work. Are you showing pictures also? Okay. So you'll see that Swami once wrote just a single page about how we should offer, you know, social service, which I think is uh, natural for us as devotees to want to do. But what form it should take, how we can express not just elevate people's, not just dignity, but as he put it, divinity. He said, how can you serve the God in people? And uh, I was traveling there two years ago. And the head of Ramakrishna Mission with whom we work, he mentioned a very interesting thing. And Ramakrishna Mission is known everywhere for their deep social service. They've been offering it for over a century. And he said, in Brindavan, Ananda has taught us how to offer seva. And how, he says, it, it is a level, the Swami said, which I've never seen. He said, I've never seen such consciousness in charitable work. So I'll let Vineet describe it and how it ties to what Swamiji wanted. Thank you, Adityaji. So, like uh, Adityaji was mentioning that uh, I was visiting Brindavan on Monday, this Monday, and it seems like a long time because for some reason there are so many things which happen and there's always inspiration flowing. And this special week of Swamiji's Moksha anniversary just had a flow of inspiration in and of itself for me. But especially with Brindavan, now I would like to read a very brief phrase from uh, the word, the way of Ananda Sanghis, which Swamiji wrote. I'll read that and then let's share some stories about uh, the Brindavan work which is going on. So Swamiji wrote the way of Ananda Sanghis in that he says, We believe that man's highest duty is to realize himself as an expression of all pervading Satchit Anandam. And then he goes on to say, we embrace for ourselves the need to embody this realization in our lives by daily performing at least one specific, conscious, personally selected act of service to our, to our fellow beings. I'll just repeat a few words. Daily performing at least one specific, conscious, personally selected act of service. You know, once I went with a friend of mine to an orphanage and uh, we were just sharing with one of the acharyas that the photos, this is it and this is what we did. And he said, oh, very good. You should perform at least one specific act of service every day. And this friend of mine, instead of being happy that I accomplished something, he said, oh, oh. And I was like, what happened to him? And he said, uh, sir, but what about the days when we have not done one specific act of service? And the Acharya very humorously said, oh, they are, those are all backlogs, <laughs> so we have to clear them up. But with this visit to Brindavan, I think they are doing just more than one specific act of service. It was just amazing. The moment I entered Brindavan, uh, I went with a friend of mine, and uh, there was someone to welcome us uh, from Brindavan, from the team. And the moment we entered, he greeted us, and we entered the Ramakrishna uh, Charitable Trust, the hospital. And there are uh, all our staff in Brindavan, they wear a very nice colored blue jacket. No matter what they're wearing, their identity is the blue jacket. And now people, whenever there is trouble in the city, anyone needs help, anyone is, sometimes it unfortunately happens that someone is lying around the road. They just say, oh, go, go search for the people in blue. They will help you. They will definitely help you. When there's a bus which comes down and there is a lady who's just been abandoned by her family, just, you know, for some reason or the other, so many of them come and they just say, go search for the people in blue and they'll help you. And it was just amazing that they have not just, of course, everyone does charity in one way or the other. Everyone shares and wants to share, but they have just defined charity, defined service in a completely different way. And to me, it felt like Swamiji was so real over there. And how? 
I was walking with one of the staff there who was wearing a uh, blue, and I just saw the moment she entered into the hospital, there were all these ladies, the mat matas as we call them, they just went around and hugged her and started wishing her and greeting her. And then I thought, okay, maybe she's a special one and maybe they know her well and maybe because she visits the hospital again. But I started this journey in the morning and till the end, any staff I saw in blue was basically ran across, hugged and greeted and told, thank you so much. But what special are they doing really? They're just, you know, following this one very simple principle. It's not very, very difficult. It's very simple. And we take care of around 4,000 widows over there, widows, sadhus, uh, matas who can't take care of themselves and also anyone in need we have the most beautiful part over there is we have not restricted our work that this is what we do anything is needed in the city we are there to serve and so when uh, this uh, friend of mine shared that you know we have we serve around 4000 people 4000 is our baseline so I, I i didn't understand what is baseline so my friend said oh baseline is something like we have a database i said that's wonderful but he said wait the database does not mean having the name and the phone number, which is my understanding. The database means we know exactly where the Mata or the Sadhu is in the city specifically. And every day morning we distribute milk and vegetables. And this is the most amazing blend of the East and West. Master used to say one day East and West would unite. And when I saw the work over there, it was just amazing to see that uh, they have uh, split the city into six uh, different uh, sectors like you can say they have for the sake of organization they have split the city into six and six places have the six heads and under them there are more other staffs so I went, went to one of the places and guess what she opened a register and showed it to me she said uh, the staff she said so this is a baseline uh, this is the data how we maintain I said how interesting let me just see it was all in Hindi all manual all written it had details of the matas right from what is her need? What are the physical challenges she's facing? Hypertension, sugar, BP. I, I'm not a doctor, but the, uh, the disease you can imagine, important ones, it was written. If she falls ill, who supports her? Is there someone to support or do we support? And many places it was written PY, 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 and they, they are held by PY. And I was like, what is this PY? I mean, who supports them when nobody is there? Paramhans Yogananda. <laughs> Isn't that amazing when most of the people it was just PY and I was just amazed and this, this it was a very big register and they had everything how do we support them do we give them monthly ration do we give them milk do we give them medicines and it is their job every I cannot just you know break that whole day into 10 minutes I'll try my best but it was amazing and then they had a register where they issue milk every day to the matas they come and they uh, take the milk and go. And then just, I, I hope we all have seen the attendance register in the schools which we have. You say, Vineet, present ma'am, Aditya, present ma'am, and then the teacher marks a slash, slash, slash. And so similarly, they have an attendance register which says 1 to 200. And just behind, at the end of the register, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, each one's photo is there. They can identify each person. And I said, uh, okay, great, but what uses this register? And they say, sir, if we see any lady, any mata, who doesn't come for more than three days, if you're absent for more than three days, we go to their house and visit what has happened. Are they not well? Are they, uh, what happened to them? Are they out of the city? Uh, did just, are they sick? Are they not able to walk off to, out of the place, out of their houses? They go there and personally give them milk. And to those sadhus, to those matas who are just not able to go out of the place, it is the job of so many staff, and I wouldn't even say job, it is the seva of so many staff over there to just go visit personally and give them. And uh, we also have some uh, homes, care homes, where Matas who can't just even take care of themselves, there they are, you know, and they, we, are, we maintain them and there are always staff who stay there and things like that. And when I entered the first care home, I just looked around, I said, okay. And then I entered the second care home, I said, okay. But I just had this question in my mind that they said for the ladies who can't take care of themselves, for the matas who are not able to take care of themselves. And these ladies were laughing, jumping, bouncing, la and just having a good time. And they were so healthy, so joyful. You look into their eyes and they are like, wow, 
they cannot be not well and when we just walked out and i was going through this mental questioning uh, one of the main staff there she said you know sir at the end we were talking to a lady this lady spoke for almost like 5 to 10 minutes just sharing her experiences there and she said uh, and i thought she was absolutely well if there was someone not to be there she shouldn't be there but she said uh, she is going through blood cancer i said oh but it didn't look in her face it didn't look in her consciousness and they had shown her to the doctor and the doctor said that well uh, you know she doesn't have much time but uh, we can give her some medicines the medicines would cost 7000 rupees per day but even the medicines will not cure her they might help her a little with the pain and when this lady got to know that uh, you know i have got cancer she went uh, to the uh, staff and she said oh i got to hear i've got cancer oh no and this these people are just they mean business when they are serving they said who told you you have cancer there's nothing like you are going to uh, you know nothing like that just rub that thought away from you eat well live healthily and live joyfully you will all be fine and when they met the doctor after two months the doctor just couldn't believe it i mean how do you how do you just define that and then later she said that we used to sit with her every day in the night helping her with her body listening to her stories just letting her come out of whatever she was going through well is she cured well i don't know but she surely has been cured on a very higher level and that is what service really means and i was listening to an interview of swami ji where a lady asked what will your legacy be and swami ji said a few things and he said kindness i want that kindness to be my legacy and when you saw these ladies being hugged when this cancer patient being cured and not on a higher level that is kindness and that is how swami ji touches one another when i first came to ananda i was i read autobiography of a yogi i was i was just in a very 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 bad state mentally i could say and it was just like master read the autobiography of a yogi master wrote the autobiography of a yogi he was the most uh, you know he was one person whom i could look to but he is left his body he is no more in the body and i thought okay fine maybe he might have disciples so i thought yes 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 and uh, i i looked on ananda i found various things and then i found ananda i opened the website of ananda and it said swami kriyananda direct disciple of paramahansa yogananda left his body and i just was so hopeless that i'm done for this life i just closed the window walked off the room never to look back at the screen again but something in me lingered and then i went back hit the website again i called up the number and some of us might know naya swami haridas who leads the center in bangalore i spoke to him just for one minute and my intention was kriya yoga i'll take kriya yoga just get out of this place i have got nothing to do yogananda is not there kriyananda is not there i'm done well i was a little foolish <laughs> yogananda is here <laughs> kriyananda is here and all of them are here just everyone over here and my basic impression was first i called i was this restless sort sir uh, so i i saw your website and i see that there's a level 1 class coming so after this i i i, I saw meditation class coming so do i get kriya initiation as I, as soon as i finish this and he said oh, no then we have this level 2 class which goes on for these many weeks i said okay so then i get kriya initiation he said wait 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 and then we have the level 3 class and then we have, we go through discipleship and this happens then we get level, uh, kriya initiation he said no wait and he was very patient with me but the moment i put down the phone i felt this is the place i want to go and why was that so each of us who have come to the path have been touched in some unique way by that kindness which swami ji was talking about that love that generosity uh, in that very same interview i was talking about uh, swami ji was asked what are the principles uh, at ananda and i thought in my mind this is going to be swami ji's answer people are more important than things which is very important yatha dharma satya jaya and it's very bad that we sometimes end up uh, quote and quote stereotype answers also but swami ji's answer was just amazing i'll just read that so the question was what are some of the principle ananda lives by we live by kindness first of all we live by generosity we try to help other people that is what ananda is about whatever we feel at ananda is really because of swami ji and then 
this is the detailed answer he gave. I would finish this by reading the question which the interviewer asked, what will be your legacy? And he said, I hope my legacy will be the truths that I have expressed through my books, the harmony that I have been able to create in a large number of people together because there really is harmony. I know somebody who was visiting there recently said, I didn't meet one unkind person. And that kindness, I would like that to be a legacy. I would like living together and working together be a legacy. I would like to think that seeing things in a new way is a legacy. We should look at everything anew, so all these can be my legacy. Now I would like to invite Aditya Ji to share. Good evening, friends. Thank you, Vineet, for helping just revise those things, you know, Swami's legacy. And uh, I would like a printout of that. I also want to read, start with a small reading Swamiji wrote. And this was just on the evening before he passed away. So it must be the evening, late evening of 20th April 2013. And uh, Swamiji's secretary, Naya Swami Lakshman, who at that time would communicate to others, you know, Swami's uh, writings, he mentioned that this probably was the last piece. Uh, officially that he wrote probably but the interesting thing is this is a foreword to a book which Swami first wrote in 1960s this was called cooperative communities how to start them and why part of the you know, how do you live together why should you live together how this can help us spiritually and this is what he wrote over here the second afterward because the first one he wrote in 60s it is now April 2017 the uh, 13 it is now April 2013. I am visiting our community near Assisi, Italy, one of our 10 communities worldwide, which have a total residency of about a thousand people. In June, I will return to Ananda village, Nevada city for three months. Three months later, I'll return to our work in India. I will soon be 87, old enough perhaps to call it a day. But things keep happening. This fall, a film will be released worldwide about Ananda called Finding Happiness. Eight more films are planned, though I will need to be personally involved in only some of them. I have one more book to write, The Promise of Immortality, Part 2. Perhaps I'll get an opportunity for a little of that seclusion. That has been my lifelong dream. It may be fairly said that I have done a fair amount in my life. Started nine communities, written 150 books, composed about 420 songs and instrumental pieces, taken some 15,000 art color slides, given countless thousands of lectures and classes in many countries and in five languages. Ananda has now become more than a place, it is a principle. Our communities have shown that it is possible to live in brotherhood, harmony, and serviceful happiness. All that I have done has been for God and for my Guru. I have had no personal desire in anything that has been accomplished. I'll repeat that. I have had no personal desire in anything that has been accomplished. Many years ago, Daya Mata said to me, I look forward to the day when I can look back and see what a great work Master has accomplished in coming to this world. I answered her, By then, I hope I really won't care. This is all God's dream, not my own. I will be happy to have been of service to it, but in the end, that's all it is, a dream. God is the only reality. So of course, you know, Swamiji was mentioning, I think, uh, in that letter that uh, Vineet was reading that his legacy is his books, you know, his music, his pictures, many of the things, the communities, the people he has trained. Uh, once he wrote the vibration I'm leaving behind, he said for a spiritual master, uh, yeah, as was our guru, he said the legacy is really unseen. It's mostly spiritual and it can be picked. You know, I often think of this master said, my words are sowed in the ether. So where do you get his legacy from? You get it from the ether, when our body, when our mind, when our heart is ready for it, Master says you can receive those benefits and of course his grace will be there to help us fulfill. They are, you might say, visionaries of a very high order. But here I wanted to discuss one legacy of Swamiji which I think a part of us always wants to 
realize, but the other half, especially for us grown-ups, just does not even understand. And that legacy is, the teaching is, is life really a dream? <laughs> We call it a dream. All the scriptures declare it. This is a dream. Master says this life is no more real than a movie. How seriously do we take movies? Tragic movies, comedy movies, well-made movies, some not so well-made. How seriously do we take life? How seriously do we take the news that we see around us? How seriously do we treat things that happen to us? Or might be trying to happen by Guru's will, but we are not interested. Like somebody once said, Swami says, what about this? The master asked us to do this. And the disciple said, I'm not interested, frankly. So what are you interested in? You're interested in something you like, but if this is a dream, who created this dream? And first of all, my question is, is this a dream? Because all masters said it, and Swami's ending his life work by saying, I don't care. The other question I want to, uh, because this was put forward by a couple, when they told their daughter, she was heading for the school bus, and she said, I don't want to go really. And they said, well, go, go, you'll be just fine. God is with you. And she asked this question. She said, but oh, what? he's in the kitchen altar, no? <laughs> That's where he is. We offer prayers to him every day. I said, yes, he is there, but he's also everywhere. And the child was very happy. Really? He is going to go to school with me? I said, yes. But then what about sister? What about Didi? Won't he go with her? And the father explained, the mother said, oh no, he is going with her also. <laughs> and the child said, how can he go to both places? With both people, despite being in the kitchen altar. So the thing is, we sometimes, you know, now we intellectualize them. So one is the question that the child is asking and happily understood the, and accepted the explanation. Okay, God is going to school with me. Let's board the bus. I'm fine. The other thing is, is life a dream? So let's say what, now of course we know the teaching master did say, he confirmed also. He said, this is a dream, but to what kind? Many times we say, oh, this is a dream. And we don't care about it. Just like we forget our dreams, we may, we choose to sometimes live in a dream of our own. Master says that is often the reality. When the masters come and they say, wake up. We say, let me sleep. And he says, okay. Master says that. Then the guru says, okay, I came because you were calling me. Now, if you want to sleep, I'll wait for you. So what is the waking state? Now, normally when we are sleeping, we have, a, it's a small dream. Lasts for perhaps a few minutes, a few hours. In this reality that we are living, Master says, this is God's dream. Swami was saying, it's God's dream. I'm happy I had to play a role. We actually, Master says, can create a, a good dream out of it or a bad. He said, when God created this universe, as we all know, consciousness is what He is. He is Satchit Ananda. He is bliss. I won't be answering the question why He created it because that again is an intellectual exercise and master says God does not appear to most people because he knows they're going to argue with him they're going to take account what about this suffering of mine but if we pick it up from a high point friends which I think is in our favor we see that who has become you and me master says consciousness which is pure joy became us it became a thought it could not contain itself even on the thought it manifested further, it became light and energy. Even that was not enough. And Master says, why was that not enough? He says, because it still looked similar. God wanted every atom to be different. That's why we are all looking different. Our nature is different. Our tendencies, our questioning, our approach, even though we may be practicing the same thing, when we return, there will not be another you. And again, our mind may tell us, this sounds too much, I'm not going to think about it. Well, that's a folly. Either accept it if you, again, want to experience deeper realities, or as Swami was saying, do your part, but at least ask the Creator, what kind of, how great was your consciousness? It's like being beggarly from a father who is the richest person in the world. And we do not, we can't conceive he is so rich. So we are wanting to choose, no, no, he must be more or less just as poor as I am. How much more different can he be? And there we place a mental 
barrier on our own capacities our own limitation we start questioning we start going into doubt and swami's approach how did he live this dream he has written a song called life is a dream time and space is part of it but he had the right attitude to go through it he says through non attachment through discrimination through deep personal involvement with the work of the guru master says to be in tune with me serve my work what does attunement mean why should we be in tune with master well he was on our side he used to fight with divine mother he said once he was arguing mother every and this he lived as you will know during world war 1 world war 2 and such and during one of these in trials he was questioning to divine mother he says everybody is very disturbed and she said but this life is a dream he said i know that mother but they don't know this he says that is why i sent you yogananda tell them this life is a dream he said but they don't understand they forget and he said after a few more questioning of this sort she said to him this is how it is so it is up to us to understand that okay if this is not our dream like i said our dreams happen every night sometimes in the day also sometimes during meditation <laughs> but when we are serious about helping others when we are questioning what is happening in the world when we are worried about difficult situations that are arising when we are wondering if at all there is a solution to this remember the only people who have found the true answers are the masters swami krishnananda ji he would often go to a dentist and never take a painkiller master was once helping some devotees put a wishing well you see how far they go in trying to help us what is a wishing well you offer a prayer and you throw a coin in that wishing well and your prayer is answered so he was all for that direction he has actually put that wishing well in the gardens of mount washington but suddenly that well which they were moving it was made of concrete swami says it was about 300 pounds it slipped and fell on his foot master says let me show you how real or unreal life is <laughs> he says my physical toe is crushed but i'm going to raise my consciousness to this point and he did and the devotees told swami ji later they said all pain was gone from his face there was only bliss he says now i will enter body consciousness thought energy matter and he was shaking and sweating his face was red he said i am raising it again and they say he did that many times just to show to the devotees who were receiving training over there that this is possible is it easy not at all what are our options should we call this life real one of the journalist i'll send you that interview if you remind me was questioning swami ji in an interview and he says sir so there is so much suffering in this world uh, this reality you know is overwhelming for most people swami says this is not the reality he says yes but it seems real swami says yeah it seems real but this is not the reality <laughs> he says bliss is the only reality and this happened two three times in the interview the person tried to say but you see people are dying he says in this reality swami says this is not the reality i am suffering that is not the reality who is this i so that i think is also the kind of legacy which sometimes we don't get even from our families even best friends it often enters falls into self pity and we may think on an egoic level oh that is my good friend they they are my well wishers they are consoling me they are supporting me but in the long run who is the one person who is silently supporting us who promises i will each time come as many times as you choose to sleep i will come through my own example through my words through my books through my music i will be there to help is that brindavan work a dream it is part of god's dream should we act over there should we act over here should we meditate yes by going through that by living in the right consciousness alone master says you reach a point where you understand that this is a dream i have i am a part of it i have been given free will master says and it is not just a dream in the sense that you say oh i don't care then he says there are every level has a reality he says if you choose to stay over there there is a satanic reality it will keep you there if you choose to move towards freedom towards cooperation many times we complain god is not helping me how much are you developing your understanding of him how much time are you spending if you are spending all your time let's say outwardly of course we fail to realize that simultaneously there is that reality of bliss 
But if our experience of it is very less, if we have not become familiar with it, naturally we call the other things a reality. So I think what Swami created, as he was saying, Ananda is no more a place. It has become a principle, not just by the example of the masters he spoke about, but by his own example, through the teachings, through the sheer enthusiasm of being involved, but not being a part of it. He said, I would, you know, he would write books, he would read books, he would share, he would lecture, travel, meet people on all levels in the society. He himself, you know, he lived at times when there was no money in his pocket to when he just had to sometimes wish it and towards the end of the life as those who were with him for a long time, they said, now Divine Mother is simply fulfilling every, he has to only think of it and it is given to him to accomplish more and more in his life that he showed again that this is, there is order in this world. As much as it is a dream, think of somebody who could create time, who could create space, who could give intelligence. Master said, God became the stones, trees, animals, human beings, our intelligence, our ego, our will. And as we start moving towards that final goal, moksha, in our own self, Master says, there is no other goal. Mentally, the mind may confuse you by saying, oh, it's not for me. Master said it will come with a natural inevitability. <laughs> you cannot escape that goal, but we have to cooperate. It's like the shore to move towards it, to land over there. We have to paddle. We have to cooperate with those waves. And I think that is the kind of service Swami was saying. That is the kind. He said not just dignity, but also to reestablish divinity. On one level, you might say it seems like he was serving you and me. But I think in a higher sense, he was serving his guru. And even a greater higher sense, which Master would say, he was serving God, not questioning God, not arguing with God, not getting exasperated with God. How many more lectures? Yet another book. He was a little bit saying that in that letter, I have done quite a bit. But what else would you do, Swamiji would say. He was not actually a big fan of thanking devotees. He said, what else would devotees do? You're a devotee, you've chosen a guru, you have to make the complete offering of yourself. Once Swamiji, when he was a young man, this is how he was trained. His father was visiting the monastery, so Swami said, he wanted to take permission. He said, sir, he told, master, my father, and in that moment, master stopped him. And he said, you have no father. And Swami, he said, I'm sorry, my heavenly, uh, my earthly father <laughs> is visiting the monastery. If you give me the permission, I would like to go and meet him. And Master says, yes, but let me trim your beard. It's a bit too big. So you see, he was human on that level, but he would not allow ignorance to enter that consciousness of a devotee, even for a moment. Because my father, my good father, my sorrow, my happiness, this my is at the end of the whole trouble. So I think for me, I was thinking that's such a legacy which uh, we may choose to forget many times, but I think he always upheld it. And despite his accomplishments, a beautiful life, he says, well, this is a dream. I'm happy I did something. He would always ask Divine Mother, just like Master, what should I do? What do you want me to do? How did he accomplish so much? Somebody asked him. He said, by every morning praying, what is thy will, Master? He said, not mine, but thy will. And it seems like when we approach that, we go in that direction, God must break his silence and he must come and tell us, this is what I want you to do today. This is what I want you to do. So I think the chaos we see in the world is temporary. It has always been there. Master says, you can actually never perfect this world. He says, this is just to train our minds to see where is the real source of intelligence and the joy that we are seeking. He says, how can I find that joy inside? by making the complete offering of my aspirations for God and Guru alone. How to get to know God's nature. I think that is what Kriyananda Ji, joy through Kriya, meditation and also service. So we'll now have an Aarti.